Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for the revelation of the truth. We thank you that you're open in the eyes of our understanding. We thank you that we are teachable, receptive to truth. We thank you and praise you that as we receive what is the truth, we thank you that we will act upon accordingly. And Father, we thank you for all that you bring forth in this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. Tonight we're going to share with you on the subject of the truth about Christmas. The truth about Christmas is a subject which is important for all of us because this is the most popular holiday in the world. And it is celebrated as the birth of Jesus Christ, a memorial to that by many, many, uh, whether they're in the church or whether they're even outside of the church. Well, we need to know the truth about this. And looking at this subject, the points to consider, number one, we need to look at the historical roots of Christmas. Where did it come from? How did it start? Where did it start? What's it all about? Second, the biblical account of the birth of Jesus to determine the time when Jesus was born. And third, look at the modern customs of Christmas, celebration, and see what they're all about. We must look at them and find out, and we can see very clearly what this is all about. The name Christmas originally is, was called a Mass for Christ. That's where you get the term Christmas, Mass for Christ. In the 11th century, it was called Christie's Mass. Later, it became called Christ's Mass. And finally, it was shortened to Christmas. Took off one of the S's, so you really didn't realize what it's all about. Because it was all started by the Catholic Church. Who began the Mass for Christ? It was started by the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Emperor, Constantine, supposedly was converted to Christianity, but still had his pagan ways. Constantine made Christianity the state religion in 313 A.D. under the Roman Catholic Church. This is where he was merging paganism and Christianity together. Why was a Mass for Christ set up? A Mass for Christ was started to please the Roman pagans and to persuade them to join the Roman Catholic Church. Now, why did they want that? Because they were trying to get everybody out to stay. They had such problems. There was such tremendous uh, persecution of Christians, and, and they had to do something to bring the pagans and the church together. The pagans worshipped the birthday of their unconquered sun god that they referred to him as, and they did it on December 25th. The Roman Catholic Church then, in order to appease the pagans and to try to bring some kind of uh, uh, order, appointed December 25th as the birthday of Jesus to coincide with the birthday of the sun god, so everybody would be happy about that. And they appointed, notice, doesn't say that it was, they appointed it to coincide with the birthday of the sun god. Did the early church celebrate December 25th as Jesus' birthday? No. You look through history, you read historical books, way back, they never celebrated this. No historical evidence whatsoever that true born-again Christians celebrated Jesus' birthday as December 25th prior to 313 when it was made uh, the, state religion, the state religion in Rome and also appointed as the birthday of Jesus. In 320 A.D., Julius I, who was the Bishop of Rome, officially established this Mass for Christ and on December 25th, he set it as a feast of the church, one of the feasts of the church. Is that in the Bible? No. Does the Bible speak about feasts that are of God in the Word of God? Yes, it does. The feasts of the Lord are declared in Leviticus 23, other passages that refer to it as well. And there's seven feasts occurring in three feast seasons. The feasts of the Lord are Passover, which is the feast of Passover, feast of unleavened bread, and the feast of first fruits. That's the first season. Pentecost, which is the second feast season, 50 days after the time of the resurrection, of which is the first feast of first fruits, and that's the feast of Pentecost. And then the third one is Tabernacles, where we have the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of, feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacles. Passover occurred on the 14th day of the first month of the Hebrew calendar, also known as Aviv, also known as Nisan. And the first month on the Hebrew calendar, this is the first the name of the month, Nisan or Aviv, it's a lunar calendar, you must understand. God's calendar is a lunar calendar, not a solar calendar. 
It's in March or in the beginning of April, depending upon the lunar cycle of that particular year. This is when Jesus was crucified on the very day of Passover in fulfillment of the Feast of Passover. Unleavened bread began on the 15th day of the first month and lasted through the 21st day. This is a day where they were putting away all the leaven, which is a type of sin. And Jesus was made sin on the cross, and what did he do at this time? He bore it all away in hell for three days and three nights in the heart of the earth to pay the price for sin. Then, after he was raised from the dead, then on the first fruits, the first fruits fulfillment was on the morrow after the weekly Sabbath, when Jesus went up to heaven and he poured out his blood on the mercy seat and presented himself as having been raised from the dead, the firstborn from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus being the firstborn from the dead, Old Testament saints also received the gospel, came up out of Abraham's bosom in the upper compartment of hell. They got their bodies as well. The next one was 50 days later, Pentecost, occurring 50 days after first fruits, which is in the third Hebrew month, Siwan. This is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and that was the beginning of the church age. And when did this occur? On the day of Pentecost. All four of these occurred on the exact day. The next one is in the third feast season, trumpets, in the seventh Hebrew month, which is September, October, depending upon how it falls in the lunar calendar. It occurs on the first day of the Hebrew seventh month, Tishri. And this is the day when the catching up of the church to meet Jesus in the air will occur at his second coming. The Day of Atonement occurs on the tenth day of the seventh month. This is the day of judgment for sin when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and put the blood on the mercy seat, which would cover over for the sins of the people. This is the day when judgment will come on the nations who reject Jesus as Savior. It's the Day of Judgment. is the Day of Atonement. Then we come to Tabernacles. Tabernacles is on the same seventh month, occurring on the 15th to the 21st day of the Hebrew seventh month. That would be in October in our calendar. That would begin beginning of October or sometime in the middle of October. The 15th to 21st day would be. That's the day that God comes to tabernacle with man because that's what tabernacles is all about. The final fulfillment of this will be when the Father comes to tabernacle with us when there's a new heavens and a new earth. <coughs> In the, also, an uh, interim fulfillment will be when Jesus comes back and establishes millennial reign, which is also at the time of tabernacles. But there was also a beginning fulfillment of this, a beginning fulfillment of this where the, we're going to come and dwell with man, and that was the time of the birth of Jesus. Because it's important that we look at when was Jesus born. Was he born on December 25th? No, as you will see. It was appointed, remember, the birthday of Jesus to coincide with the birthday of the unconquered son to please the pagans. Luke chapter 2 in verse 8. Here, and we're going to look at this verse first of all. Luke chapter 2 in verse 8. In Luke 2, 8, we see what it says. They were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. So this is when the shepherds were out in the field with the sheep. What's it say? Shepherds in the field with the sheep, and they were brought in during the rainy season. They weren't left out there. They were brought in. And when was this? From November to February. Well, this is prior to that. The rainy season was November to February, so they would have been brought in. The next one is Luke chapter 2 and verse 1. In Luke chapter 2, verse 1, we see another point that must be addressed came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. The tax, after the taxing was made when Serenius was governor of Syria. It says, all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. That was the requirement. Joseph went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. He had to go back to that to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. She was ready to deliver at this time. So this is the time of the tax. So it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. So that shows us something. The time of the Roman tax was at the time of the harvest, which was at the time when they would have to go back, to, and they didn't do it in the rainy season. They went back in the time of the harvest, which was always at the time of the seventh month when the harvest was completed, that would naturally be the time when the tax would be accomplished after they'd harvested their crops. And that's exactly when it was. History supports that. 
that it was at the time of the harvest. So that shows us it was around the time of the seventh month as well. Then we have Luke chapter 2, verse 7. In Luke chapter 2, verse 7, it says, She brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Why was there no room for them in the inn? All the rooms were taken. Why would all the rooms be taken? Certainly in the middle of the rainy season, they wouldn't all be taken. But the reason why they were all taken is because of the fact that everybody was there for tabernacles. No room in the inn. Everybody was there for tabernacles. And so Jesus then was not born in a room. Instead, he was born in a temporary dwelling place in a stable. We see John chapter 1, verse 14, tells us something about when Jesus was born. John chapter 1, verse 14, he says this, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. You cannot tell this from the King James without looking up the word for dwelt. The word dwelt is a Greek word, skenoo, which means to tabernacle, to have one's tabernacle, abide in a tabernacle, fix one's tabernacle, or simply to tabernacle. And this is the way it should have been translated if it was translated best. It's been translated well, dwell in the authorized version, but it actually means to tabernacle. So here it says, and this is why Young's brings it out clear, he says, the Word became flesh and did tabernacle among us. What's that tell you? That's telling you pretty much the time when he came. He came to tabernacle because that's what tabernacles was all about. God was coming to dwell with man. So the time when Jesus was born is at the time of tabernacles. As we point out, it means the tabernacle revealing the time of his birth. Jesus would have been born sometime between Tishri 15, which is the first day of tabernacles, and Tishri 21, during the Feast of Tabernacles, that would have been during the month of October. The Feast of Tabernacles was also known as the Feast of Sukkot, or the Feast of Booths. Remember that Jesus was not bo born in a room. He had to go out in a stable, in a temporary dwelling place. The Jews made temporary booths, or dwelling places, to reside in during this feast. Why? It was pointing towards Two things. Number one, that God, that Jesus was going to be born in a temporary dwelling place. They should have been able to recognize that. And also the fact that we are in temporary dwelling places and that we're not always going to be in that state in our body. We're going to get brand new bodies. And also in temporary dwelling places in an earth bound by the devil, which is, of course, he's going to be cast into the bottomless pit and Jesus is going to come and rule and reign. Jesus was born in a temporary dwelling place or a booth, like a manger, not in a room or in the inn. His place of birth signifies that he was born during the time of tabernacles. That would have been during the month of October. We can also know the time of his birth from the conception of John the Baptist, the time when he was conceived. And we look here in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, 8, 9, 11, and 13, and we'll look at that for a moment. In Luke in chapter 1, we pick up here in verse 5. It was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments, ordinances of the Lord, blameless. They didn't have a child. Elizabeth was barren, and they were now well stricken in years. But it came to pass while he executed the priest's office. This tells you something about John the Baptist, uh, John here. He was executing the priest's office here before God in the order of his course. And so here he says, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. He had, this is part of his, what he had to do during the priestly duties that he had to carry out. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of the incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. So this is talking about Zacharias here, Elizabeth and, and Zacharias. I said John, I didn't mean to say it. All right, his name was Jack Zacharias. And so here the angel comes, and he was troubled, fear fell upon him. And the angel said, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayers heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. So this is talking about something that's significant because this is the time when Zacharias was in the temple serving, and he was of the course of Abiah, which is also known as Abijah in the Old Testament. 
and they had certain courses that the priests would carry out their service. There were 24 different courses, and he was of the eighth course. That's what the one of Abai is. And we see this over in 1 Chronicles chapter 24. We'll go over to that. 1 Chronicles chapter 24. And it speaks of the divisions of the sons. So how they were divided by lot. It was first, wasn't it first? Or did I say second? It was first, Chronicles 24, yeah. They were divided by lot, one sort with another. And then we come to verse 7. The first lot came forth to this one and the second one to another one. And we go down and we see this eighth lot came to Abiah. Abiah, Abijah, which is the same as Abiah. So he was of this eighth lot. That meant that his responsibility was to serve during his course in the eighth course. Well, the eighth course would have been the second half of the fourth month because they had like two week times where they would uh, two weeks in a row where they would serve. So it would start with the first month. There were two of those courses. The second month, two more would be up to four. The third month, two more up to six, and then the seventh and eighth would have been during the fourth month, the fourth Hebrew month we're talking about, and that was during the month of Tammuz. Well, so. This particular time in the month of Tammuz, this is a time which is between like June and July, depending upon how it falls on the uh, lunar calendar. And we see in Luke uh, 11, 1, 23, we go back to that, Luke chapter 1, verse 23, came to pass as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, so as soon as that was over, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. So it was right after that that she conceived and hid herself five months. So we know the time that he conceived was at the end of the, the, his course when it was completed. So she would have conceived at that time. At this point, the angels came to Mary. Uh, we'll see in Luke chapter, we'll go back to Luke and see what happened here. In verse uh, 20. Uh, six, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee. Let's go back here for a minute, because it said how she hid herself five months. So she's five months pregnant. And then in the sixth month, so she's six months pregnant, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came into her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord's with thee, blessed art thou among women. When she saw him, she was troubled with the saying, cast her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And she, the angel said, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He'll be great, shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So here, the angel comes, and Elizabeth is six months pregnant this time. If we take Elizabeth's six months plus Mary's nine months, we have 15 months, which from a Hebrew calendar standpoint of 30 days, that'd be 450 days. If we take the second half of the fourth Hebrew month, which is Tammuz, that would reveal John's conception is after Tammuz 15, because the first half month would be the first 15 days, the second half month would be the second 15th days. So it'd be sometime after the 15. 450 days from this brings us to Tishri 15. Jesus would have been born on or after Tishri 15, which is when? The time of tabernacles. Do we know the exact day? No. Is it important that we know the exact day? No. People would have a tendency to worship the day and make a big deal out of the day when that's not important whatsoever. So Jesus would have been born at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles in the second half of the seventh month, Tishri, which is our month, October. He was not born on December 25th. December 25th, remember, was appointed the birthday of Jesus by the Roman Catholic Church in the 4th century, in 312 uh, AD, to coincide with the birthday of the unconquered sun god of the pagans. Tishri 15 through Tishri 21 is the Hebrew seventh month. Jesus would have been born at some time at then. If he was born on Tishri 15, the date of his conception of Mary would be Tebeth 12, I'll tell you why I'm bringing this out in a moment. Because some people try to say, well, he wasn't born then, but he was conceived then. A lot of people trying to fight for their 
their day, and they'll say he was conceived then. If you go back, the date of, of the conception would be uh, Tevith 12, 270 days to Tevith 12, roughly uh, the first day of the menstrual cycle. Doctors always count 280 days to determine the due date. Ovulation begins on the 14th day, so if a woman conceived on the earliest day of her cycle, the 14th day of her cycle, you'd count to the 280th day, which would be 266 days after the conception, 280 minus the 14 being 266, to the approximate due date, which is somewhere around that amount of time. So, the full-term pregnancy, about 266 days to 270 days, nine full months, from the date of conception to the date of birth. If Jesus was conceived on Tevith 12, and you may not know the Hebrew calendar, but I have a, a Hebrew calendar that I refer to, and so you can get them on the internet. Uh, 270 days later would bring it to Tishri 15. If conceived on Tebeth 18, 270 days later would be Tishri 21, somewhere between tabernacles when Jesus was conceived. So he would have been conceived between Tebeth 12 and Tebeth 18. Now why is that important? Because people try to say that he was conceived at the time of Hanukkah a lot of times. And we'll cover that in a moment. If we look at it from Jesus' conception, 12 Hebrew months, the lunar cycle, and get more exact, the lunar, lunar month is 29.530587 days, to be exact, from our calendar. If Jesus was conceived on Tebeth 12, there would be the 18.530587 days, the end of the month. You can just, I just took the time to calculate this out. If you multiplied that times the eight months, that would bring us 236 uh, days, and that plus this beginning days, plus the 15 days of Tishri would bring you up to 269 days, which is about 270, which is about the time of the birth of Jesus, to Tishri 15. And you could take the time to calculate this or look this up. If using 30 days a month, Tebeth 15 plus the 270 days brings you to that point, roughly. So Jesus was conceived no earlier than Tebeth 12, as we pointed out, and no, early, no later than Tebeth 19. To, to, to 20, 22, somewhere in that range, depending upon how many days it was. We're talking about three, four days or whatever, if it's a full-term child. So Jesus was not conceived on December 25th. The reason is because of the fact that that's not when, when uh, it would have been the time when he, that he would have uh, been able to be conceived in order to accomplish that. Some say that Jesus was conceived about the time of the Feast of Hanukkah, also called the Feast of Dedication, the Feast of Lights. That's what they say. Well, they say Jesus was conceived as a light coming in the world at this time. They're trying to find some way to celebrate this time. It's the, they declared to justify celebrating the conception of Jesus on December 25th instead of the birth of Jesus. The Feast of Hanukkah is from Kislu 25 through Tebeth 2. Uh, it doesn't make it up quite to 12 or to up as far as 19 Tebeth, which would have been the time when he would have been conceived. This normally occurs through the middle of the end of December, often includes this December 25th during the seven-day feast. Sometimes it can get, get that far. Jesus declared to have been conceived during this time to justify the Christmas celebration. But even if it was a case where it was, does that have anything to do with it? No, because what are we talking about? Are we talking about the conception of Jesus? No, we're talking about the birth of Jesus. But if you've heard people do this, they want to do anything they can to hold on to this celebration. So they want to say, well, he might not, have been, not, might not have been born, but a lot of national teachers out there have said, well, he was conceived, so that's okay. We can still go ahead and, and be involved in this thing. Well, false teaching. Again, Jesus wasn't conceived during this particular period. By the way, God does things on exact days. Celebrating conception during the Christmas season is false teaching. So that's an important point, and we already pointed out the fact that Jesus was not conceived on December 25th and was not born, of course, on that date. What was the origin of paganism? Started in Babylon with Nimrod, who led a rebellion against God. Nimrod started a false religious system of astrology, magic, and witchcraft. He led people into sensual enjoyment, pleasures of life without fear of wrath from a holy God. He was killed by Shem, one of Noah's sons, because he was so evil. After Nimrod's death, his wife Semiramis sought to have him honored as a god. She claimed he was the sun god. She claimed he was the promised seed of the woman prophesied in Genesis 3.15. Now, what do you say, what's this all about? Well, in Genesis 3.15, this is after the fall of man. Remember, the pronouncements were made against 
the man and the woman of the judgments and against the serpent. But then in Genesis 3.15, he says, God says, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. He's speaking to Satan here. It shall bruise thy head, and that's talking about her seed, and thou, talking about Satan, shall bruise his heel, talking about thy seed. Who's, who's, this, who's her, uh, her seed? Who's her seed? Jesus. What was Satan going to do? He was going to bruise the heel of Jesus, which happened when he was crucified. Well, G the same seed was going to bruise the head of Satan, break his rulership over mankind. And who did that? Jesus did it. So that's a, this is a prophecy about Jesus breaking the lordship of Satan over mankind. Now, so, of course, the devil knows these things, and so he always tries to twist things and bring counterfeits and deceive. So he was claiming that, oh, this is the sun god, and this is the promised seed of the woman prophesied in Genesis 3.15. It was talking about the sun god triumphing. She claimed that even though he was killed by men, that he actually freely offered himself for the good of mankind. Did he freely offer himself for the good of mankind? No, that's a lie. Semiramis became pregnant, this is Nimrod's wife, with a child, claiming she was conceived supernaturally. And she gave to a birth to a son named Tammuz, and you're going to see this in the Bible in a little bit. Tammuz is in the Bible. She declared that Tammuz was Nimrod reincarnated. This is the sun god now come to life. And this claim gave rise to the false Babylonian religion, making Tammuz, Nimrod, reincarnated, a counterfeit messiah, that he now was the savior of mankind. God always brings counterfeits, or excuse me, the devil brings counterfeits to try to lead people away from the real truth. Sun god worship was prevalent during these times. A raised Nimrod was called Zoroastes in the Chalde language. In this particular language, this word Zoroastes means the seed of the woman. That's why it was called that, referring to saying he's the seed of the woman, not this other one that's supposed to come. They were declaring the seed of the woman has been, come, and this prophecy has been fulfilled. Of course, it's a lie. The Chaldean version is that Zoroaster, with Nimrod, remember, prayed to the supreme god to take away his life for the benefit of the world. That's a lie. The Chaldeans then taught that Nimrod reappeared in the person of a son supernaturally born by his widowed wife after he had died. Again, the devil trying to deceive the world. A false messiah was proclaimed. Nimrod, the sun god, reincarnated as Tammuz, was declared to be the messiah, the savior of the world. This is what they claimed. Who was supernaturally conceived as the promised seed of the woman, Semiramis. Because remember, it talked about her seed, so it had to be coming from a woman, so Semiramis had to be the one, and so they claim that she is the one that had this promised seed, supernaturally conceived. Tammuz was worshipped as God incarnate, instead, of course, this is for, uh, looking towards the true one, which is Jesus, the incarnation of the sun god born for the purpose of subduing the enemy of the god. See, they were against the true and living god. They were rebellious against him. What's December 25th all about? It's the birthday of the unconquered sun god. Who's the sun god? Nimrod. Nimrod's declared to be the pagan messiah also. So December 25th is not only the birthday of the unconquered sun god, but also declared the birthday of the unconquered pagan messiah, the savior of the world in the pagan culture. Goddess worship also went on. Semiramis called herself the queen of heaven. You're going to see scriptures about the queen of heaven in a little bit in the Bible. It talks about this. This just wasn't pulled out of nowhere. It's in the Bible as well, which began the goddess worship. She became the object of worship as the mother of the gods. As mother of the gods, she was raised to divinity as well of her son. And both the mother and son were worshipped. That's what went on in Babylonian, and that's also what has gone on in the Roman Catholic Church. They raised the woman to the same standard that she can be now worshipped as well, claiming that she has an immaculate conception and all these things, which, of course, is a lie. It's not true at all. See, Bab Roman Catholicism came from Babylonian false religion. Babylonian false religion, they had a winter god and a summer goddess. The winter god ruled from November 1st through April 30th. 
The summer goddess ruled from May 1st through October 31st. Worship of the infant child, Tammuz, the winter god, and the goddess mother, which was Semiramis, the summer goddess, arose and began to go forth. The Bible speaks about this because remember that Semiramis was called the, that uh, goddess that they would worship was the queen of heaven. Jeremiah 44, 15 to 19, 20, 22 to 23, we'll look at it in a moment, speaks about the queen of heaven and the curses which came upon the people for their false worship. They were doing evil things. Let's look at that. Jeremiah 44. In Jeremiah 44, we see something uh, that the people had rebelled against God. And if we read the whole thing, it talks about how they were the people were rebelling against God and, and judgments were going to be pronounced upon them. He was going to punish them because of their rebellion against God. And uh, it comes in verse 14, he says, All the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, they were involved in worship of these queen of heaven, and all the women that stood by a great multitude, they were all doing this. Even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt and Pathros answered Jeremiah when he was calling them to repentance, if you look through this. And as for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. They refused to give up their goddess worship. They refused to give up their idolatry, even though the word of the Lord was spoken by Jeremiah to them. But we will certainly do whatever thing goes forth out of our own mouth, to burn incense unto the queen of heaven. That was Semiramis. See, there was quite a battle that went on to try to get people to serve the true and living God back then because they knew of him, and yet there was the false worship, the Babylonian worship that was false. Pour out drink offerings unto her as we've done. We and our fathers, our kings and our princes, and the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of victuals who were well and saw no evil. Well, the demons just withdrew the curses, you know, because you're going to worship us, we will make you think that we're the true and living God, and they just won't manifest their curses against them. That's why they, they were appeasing the demons, and they thought that they were their gods, and they were serving them. Of course, they stayed away from the true and the living God. Since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we've wanted all things have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. Well, that's because now the curses came upon them because of the fact that they weren't submitting to any, any longer to her. When we burned incense, the queen of heaven poured out drink offerings to her. Did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings to her without our men? So they were worshiping continually. And that's when Jeremiah said to all the people, the men and the women, and all the people that had given him that answer, saying, The incense you burned in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, you and your fathers, your kings, your princes, the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them and came it not into his mind. So the Lord could no longer forbear because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which you've committed. Therefore is your land a desolation, astonishment, and a curse without an inhabitant as of this day. A curse of destruction came upon them because of their evil ways. So here it speaks of these ones that were worshiping idolatry in the goddess worship of the Queen of Heaven. Ezekiel 8, verse 13 and 16 speaks here of other evil things that were going on. This is among the Jews the Israelites, and it speaks of Tammuz, and the women weeping for Tammuz, this is after he was killed at the age of 40 by a wild boar, and the abomination of the worship of the sun god in the temple of the Lord. Where does the sun come up? From the east, and they would worship toward the east, as you'll see. Ezekiel chapter 8, we'll look here at verse 13 to 16, and you'll see about this. Some people say, well, I never even heard about Tammuz. In the, it's in the Bible. Ezekiel 8, 13, he said unto me, Turn thee yet again, and you'll see greater abominations. These were abominable things that they were doing in the temple. He said, Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. They were crying over this, this guy who they thought was their God. They were worshiping him. He said unto me, Thou hast seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and you'll see greater abominations than these. He brought me in the inner court of the Lord's house. This is in the temple. Behold, at the door of the te temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, twenty-five men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, their faces toward the east, and they worshiped the sun toward the east. Who was the sun god? Nimrod, who became Tammuz, who they were worshiping, who they thought was God incarnate, the unconquered sun god. They were involved in pagan worship 
idolatrous things. This is why God brought such judgments upon them, because they rejected the true and living God and were involved in all kinds of idolatry. So, here we see it's talking about this evil that was going on. In the time of the Babylonian false worship, there were symbols of this worship. The worship of Nimrod, the sun god, was carried on through secret, mysterious symbols. Nimrod was symbolized in various forms, such as the sun, trees, fire. They would worship them through these kind of symbols. Various names were used to refer to Nimrod throughout history. Some of them are such as Baal, in the Bible it talks about that, Bacchus, who was the one that they worshipped in Babylon, Ninus, they had them in different civilizations, as you will see. They had a yearly Babylonian festival called the Festival of Bacchus. Celebration in honor of the sun god, it was on the Yule Day, which was December 25th. Yule is a Chaldean name which means infant. What were they doing? They were celebrating the birth of the infant in honor of the birth of the infant Tammuz, who was the sun god, supposedly, reincarnated. This was a great festival that they had, and it was a fe festival of drunkenness, revelry, great merriment. And during that time, they had candles lit to honor their winter god. They put the Yule log in the fire on the eve of the festival. And what are we, what's that sounding like? A lot of things that go on at the Christmas celebration about the Yule log. That must all be tied into this. You're right. This has got to understand history of where this came from so you understand why everybody does what they do. The Yule log put in the fire on the eve of the festival represented Nimrod killed by his enemies. It gets consumed. As the log is burned, the pagans would say that this log, the sun god, was said to be changed, supernaturally changed, into the mother of the sun god with the purpose of bringing forth her divine son. Otherwise, after it's consumed now, the mother is going to bring forth supernaturally this new son. On the next morning, the day of the festival, a tree is set up. The tree was believed to be Nimrod come to life again. This would be Tammuz's birth which is Nimrod being reincarnated, the tree symbolizing the newborn God and also showing that he had risen triumphant over his enemies, because remember, who was his enemy? The true and the living God, the real God. And they're claiming that he triumphed over the true and living God. That's what the tree was set up. So what is the tree symbolizing? It's symbolizing the newborn God had triumphed over the true and living God and they would set it up. They had the mistletoe in Babylon. It just didn't come from recent time. It was back in pagan Babylon worship. It was considered a divine branch that came from heaven and grew upon a tree that sprang out of the earth. By engrafting the divine branch into the earthly tree, this symbolized the joining together of heaven, the sun god, and earth, mankind, which sin had severed. Remember, they're calling him, he's the savior of mankind. Deception. The devil is a liar, and he will try to have a counterfeit to ta try to deceive men away from the truth. So the mistletoe branch became the token of man's divine reconciliation. And what do people do under the mistletoe? They kiss. What's the kiss all about? The kiss under the mistletoe symbolized the well-known token of pardon and reconciliation from Baal, the sun god. Don't ever kiss under a mistletoe, or you are essentially following this pardon or reconciliation from Baal, the sun god, which is a lie. The new tree set upright was considered the branch of God, Nimrod, the sun god, which brings all divine gifts to mankind. Otherwise, they're saying the sun god's the one that gives you everything. That's why they got the tree, and why do you think the gifts are put under the tree? Because it's all symbolizing all these gifts that you're getting are coming from Baal, from the sun god. And who in reality is that? That's Satan. Satan's the one who's behind all this stuff. It's all a lie. Satan wants worship. Remember, he wanted worship. He wanted, every, wanted Jesus to fall down and worship him. And he's doing everything he can to get worship. And he gets worship through this tree, which symbolizes him having overcome the true and living God, and that he supposedly is the branch of God that brings all divine gifts to mankind. And the whole world is putting up the tree offering worship to him whether they know it or not. From this festival with the birthday of the unconquered sun god on December 25th, we got the tree erected upright, we got the candles lit, we got the mistletoe, we got the yule log, we got the mother and the newborn infant, we got the merry festival. What's that sound like? 
No mistake that Christmas originated in the false Babylonian religious system. It didn't come from the time of Jesus being born. It was there long before any of this happened. You must understand that Babylonian religion spread throughout the world. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 8 and 9, where we'll look at, this is, remember, when God came down and confused the, the languages in Genesis chapter 11, verse 8, when the whole earth was of one language, and so the Lord scattered them abroad, thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city, and it was ba called Babel because the Lord did confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. These people are already steeped in Babylonian false worship. So as they went everywhere on the earth, what'd they do? They took their false worship everywhere on the earth as well. That's exactly what happened. Every civilization over time was influenced by the Babylonian mystery false religion. Every civil civilization has had worship of the goddess mother. If you do a study in history, you'll find they had their goddess mother and their infant son under different names. Here are some of them. Names of the mother and son worship. In Assyria, they had Semiramis and Tammuz. In Egypt, they had Isis and Osiris. In India, they had Isi and Iswara. In Asia, they had Sibyl and Diosis. In Greece, they had Ceres and Plutus. In Rome, they had Fortuna and they had Jupiter. This is their ones, where they had the mother and then they had the son, the worship. Similar feasts in Babylon, the Babylon Bacchus festival, were also in the cultures of the Egyptians, the northern Teutonic tribes of Scandinavia, the Druids, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. The feasts, all of these ones, involved trees, lights, mistletoe, yule logs, other symbols of pagan false religion. That's what they are. Well, this yearly festival they had, the Egyptians worshipped the sun god Isis. They had their merrymaking festival where they worshipped the palm tree, denoting their pagan messiah, Bel Tamar. The Saxons hung holly, ivy, and rosemary in celebrating Yule Day, offering the boar in sacrifice to the sun god, because that's what killed Tammuz, and they were mad about it. Druids honored their god Odin by tying fruits and other offerings on the branches of evergreen trees and worshipped the holly to ward off evil spirits. They would do these kind of things. The Teutonic tribes of Scandinavia had the Julman festival honoring the god Thor, where wheat was worshipped, cakes and bread baked, Houses were decorated in an effort to gain favor with the field gods. They were all looking to gods and these demons, the evil spirits, what they really were. The boar sacrifice and eaten ham. That's why they eat ham at the time of New Year's. It's all eaten the boar. See, that's, why they, that's where the tradition of eating ham came from. And the Yule log burnt to their god for good luck. These festivals flourish from civilization to civilization up to the time of Christ. At the time of Christ is the time when Rome was in charge. The Roman feast of Saturnalia was the feast of that time, celebrated by the pagan Romans when Rome was the empire in power during the time of Christ, continued during that time of the early church. Saturn was another name for Nimrod. They had all these different names, remember? And he was the god of agriculture who brought plenty in harvest. They celebrated the birthday of the unconquered son that they called Saul on December 25th. Saul also was known as the Persian god Mithra, the God of light, who is considered to be the son of righteousness. That's a lie. Where have we heard that term? That's a Bible term pointing towards Jesus. Mithraism was a major religion in the Roman Empire and a great rival to Christianity. Again, you've got to understand, Satan will bring a counterfeit before the real comes. He'll try to do that. The festival was a time of unbridled merrymaking, drunkenness, revelry, sport, banqueting with great uproar. Great, big, huge party time. During this Feast of Saturday, the impulse to spend seized everyone. That's why everybody's got to go out and spend during this time, starting with Black Friday and on. Got to spend, got to buy, got to buy. It's all the spirit of the age, the spirit of the time. People exchanged gifts with others. That's where it came from. Slaves were given temporary freedom. All public and private business was forbidden. All work was stopped except the cooks and the bakers because they had to cook all the things they were going to offer up. All law was laid aside. The courts were closed. Gambling was allowed. And basically, they could just do anything they wanted. Processions crowded streets in continual merrymaking. Houses and buildings were brightly lit, decorated with evergreens. Trees were trimmed with treats and trinkets. 
Pigs were offered as sacrifice to the sun god and then were eaten. That's the boar that they're offering up. Fir tree was worshipped as the pagan messiah, Baal Bareth, another name for the sun god. And this is what went on. Now, this history of Christmas, we see from 320 A.D., here's where Julius I officially established the Mass for Christ, the Feast of the Roman Catholic Church. By 336 A.D., he celebrated regularly in Rome. 529 A.D., a civic holiday prohibiting work or public business by Emperor Justinian. And by 563 A.D., the Council of Brage forbade fasting on the Mass of Christ. You couldn't fast. You had to eat. Basically, it was forced feasting. You're going to eat. You know, you have to do it because that's the only you had to do, participate in this thing. The history of Christmas goes on. In 567 A.D., the Council of Tours established the duty of Advent fasting in preparation for it. They had to fast ahead of time for it. End of the 5th century, this finally spread outside of Rome into Ireland. 7th century, it got to England, Switzerland, and Austria. 9th and 10th century, into Germany, Hungary, Slavic countries, and Scandinavia. And by 1180, all of Europe was affected by it. This continued. And this is a time when, again, there was the Dark Ages during this whole time until the time of the Reformation came. And that was the Reformation that showed, came up in the 1500s. When, when we see uh, in the 16th century, which was in the 1500s, when the Reformation started in the 16th century, that's when truly born-again Christians <coughs> rejected it. Why? Because they discovered all about what this is all about. When they got Bibles and they started looking at the Bible, then they started studying all this and finding out the truth about this and say, this is evil. But they saw the paganism and the false observances. It became detestable to true Christians. It brought about much conflict in Europe. As revival took hold through the Word of God, Scotland totally rejected it. It was forbidden in Scotland in, 18, in 1583 and was condemned by the preacher John Knox. John Knox did a Bible called Knox's Translation. He had its translation. Content resistance was also there in England. It was illegal when the Puritans came to power under Oliver Cromwell. You have to understand there was quite a move of God in the British Isles and in England. They were a lot of Christians. They were really following after the Lord, and there was quite a battle against the government. Uh, and finally, where they had all the kings that were in control, Oliver Cromwell and the Puritans got control of the English government. They were in charge. And while they were in control for a short time, December 22, 1657, Cromwell's Puritan Council abolished Christmas in England. They couldn't celebrate it anymore. They abolished it. They had nothing to do with it. That was a real fight going on. December 25th, Parliament worked. Soldiers made sure the shops were open. Churches were closed. Evergreen decorations prohibited. Druid religious practices were forbidden. Rioting and great conflict occurred often because there was a tremendous warfare, spiritual warfare that was going on. But in 1660, that's when Charles II, they got the uh, Cromwells out and became king and restored Christmas to England. And there was great persecution that began to come against them. Because why did they all leave uh, England, and all leave all these areas in Europe? Because of the persecution that was coming against the born-again Christians. And where did they all come to? The New World, which was the Americas. So the Puritans who came to America, settling in New England, of course, they were, you know, they got out of there, got, escaped the persecution, and now they come to this country, this new, to form this new country. And they, in the New England, passed a law barring any Christmas, obser Christmas observance in 1659. The Puritans considered Christmas an abomination, crossed it off their calendars. Why? It was all paganism. It wasn't true. It was all from the Roman Catholic Church. It was all false. It was all about proclaiming a false pagan messiah as the savior of the world who's going to pardon your sins and all these kind of things. That's a total lie. That's an abomination. In Massachusetts, if Christmas was observed, you were fined five shillings or sentenced to work or jail. In 1659, the law in Connecticut forbade the keeping of Christmas. The Puritans, the Pilgrims, the Congregationalists, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, and the Quakers had a deep abhorrence for Christmas and refused to have anything to do with it. They were some of the, settled in some of the colonies, especially the northern colonies. Other settlers continued the celebration. These are the ones that were, were ones that were kind of Catholic-oriented or offshoots of that, such as the Anglicans of the Church of England, the German Lutherans, the Dutch Reformed Christians, the German Moravians, the Episcopalians, and the Roman Catholics continued to observe it. 
Opposition to Christmas continued, though, in America as long as revival continued. As long as God was moving and revival was occurring, it never could really take a strong foothold. The Great Awakening of 1739, there was another great revival in the early 1800s. They were continually firmly opposed to it. In 1810, most of the citizens of Pennsylvania paid no attention to it. December 25th was a work day in Boston up to 1856. They didn't get anything off. And classes were held on this date up to 1870. In 1874, Henry Ward Beecher declared Christmas was a foreign day to him. He was a religious leader. 1886, American Methodist newspaper, the Christian Advocate, said more sin and paganistic ways occurred than any other day in the year. They declared it an evil day. But as more immigrants came and celebrated Christmas, opposition began to wane. The first state that made a legal holiday wasn't until in the 1800s, Alabama in 1835. Shows you how long it took from the 1600s when they came late to 1835. It took the devil that long to finally get this thing legalized. 1845 to 1865, 28 states made it a holiday, and the last state to make it a holiday was Oklahoma, 1890. Well, that was only, what, 122 years ago. So, 1885, President Chester Arthur signed a law giving all federal workers the day off, first time they could get off. And by 1900, it took hold nationally, and of course, it's the dominant holiday in the U.S. and the world today. What about this Christmas tree? The modern custom of decorated tree came from Germany around the 16th century. The real origin of the tree, though, goes back, as we pointed out, to Babylonian mystery religion. The pagans worshipped the sun god through various symbols, including the green tree. Remember, they use fire, or they use tree, all these different ways. The tree, remember, was believed to be Nimrod come to life again after having overcome his enemies, which would be the true and living god. The tree was considered Nimrod, the branch of God that brings all divine gifts to men, meaning everybody's gifts supposedly come from him. Ancient pagan groups decorated a tree and worshipped it. That's why they decorated it and would worship it. That's where that all came from. The green tree is associated with idolatry and false worship in the Bible. Is there something in the Bible that looks like a Christmas tree? You better believe it. Jeremiah 10, verse 3 to 5. Let's look at that scripture. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 3 to 5. Look what it says. For the customs of the people are vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workman with the axe. Why'd they cut the tree out? Because they're going to do something with it, in line with their paganism. They deck it with silver and with gold. They dress it all up. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. And they are upright as a palm tree. They stick this thing upright, this tree. What is that symbolizing? If that doesn't sound like a Christmas tree, what does? An upright tree, decking it with all the silver and gold, all those, those things, it cannot, it cannot speak, right? Because it's nothing. But nonetheless, it was an, Im an image of the idolatry that they were involved in worship of the tree as Nimrod. So we see the fact that this was the green tree worship, false worship. It's even in the Bible. In Egypt, they worship the palm tree as pagan messiah, called Baal Tamar. Roman Saturnalia, fir tree, denoted the pagan messiah, Baal Bereth. They had different names. Remember, they considered him their messiah, their savior. Teutonic and Scandinavian peoples worshiped the sacred fir tree. In Germany, the Yule tree first brought inside, they started bringing it inside the house now, as a modern tradition. In the eighth century, St. Boniface dedicated the fir tree to the holy child, to replace the sacred oak of the god Odin. Now they're going to change this and kind of mix this up. We're going to instead, we're going to make this tree, instead of being the pagan one, we're going to say it's the holy child. Is that to be an image of Jesus? No, but that's what they did. The symbol of pagan tree worship was then carried on by the Roman Catholic Church with all their false ways, while changing the dedication from being to a pagan god to the holy child. First decorated Christmas tree was in Germany. The custom of Christmas tree was widespread in the 18th century and became deeply rooted in tradition by the end of the 19th century. And, of course, you know what it's like today. First national recognition of the Christmas tree didn't occur until 1856 when President Franklin Pierce decorated one at the White House. How about other Christmas symbols? Hanging balls and the ornaments. They were normally round as symbols of sun worship. Angels on the tree were thought to be message bearers of the Roman and the Greek gods. They believed in that. 
candles welcome the sun's return and the winter god so that the winter god could see them and bless their household. That was their purpose. Replacement for the candles today are all the tree lights that you put on the tree. The mistletoe, the divine branch from heaven that grew upon a tree that sprang out of earth. The mistletoe symbolized the sun god joining together with man in divine reconciliation. Otherwise, Satan is the one who reconciles you, which is he's the type of what Nimrod's all about, which, of course, is a lie. He's deceived people. The kiss under the mistletoe symbolized the pardon and reconciliation of Baal, the sun god. It's all deception. Sins are not washed away or reconciled. You're not reconciled whatsoever. Holly was a symbol of fertility for men as a symbol of male reproduction. Ivy was a symbol of fertility for women as a symbol of female reproduction. And holly and ivy are also worshipped for good luck and to ward off evil spirits. Wreaths were hung for good luck and a good harvest. It was all out of something to appease the, their so-called gods. That's why people have the holly, they got the ivy, they got the mistletoe, they got the, the wreaths, all these things. It all had a purpose. It was all evil. How about Santa Claus and other Christmas symbols? That's an American symbol, but it didn't start with America. Its origin is from paganism. They had the Roman Saturnalia. They had Saturn was a giant who came bearing food, wine, joy, and revelry. The Norse god named Odin, he was a giant with a long flowing beard, and he had his elf helpers, you know, running the sleigh, you know, and the reindeer and all these kind of things. Odom had a horse named Sleepnir, forerunner of the sleigh and the reindeer. Father Christmas was the English equivalent of Santa Claus. He was a giant wearing a scarlet or green robe, lined with a fur crown with holly and ivy and mistletoe, carrying a yule log. It's all about paganism. Santa Claus came from St. Nicholas, a bishop of Myra, who did many good deeds. The Latin name, Sanctus Nicholas, or the Dutch name, Sinterklaas, or the German name, Saint Nicholas, the American name came from the Dutch settlers who named it Center Claus. In 1865, Thomas Nast, he was a noted illus illustrator, he, where we got the Republican donkey and the uh, Democratic, or, um, not the Republican, uh, Democratic donkey and the Republican elephant. He's the one that drew those things. Thomas Nast drew Santa Claus with a red suit, white whiskers, and a pot belly, and the tradition stuck. And since that time, we've had that here in this country and throughout the world. Santa Claus is God to the occult mind. He has all the qualities of God, you have to understand. This is why it's evil for everybody to teach their children about Santa Claus and then think that this is okay. And I'll tell them later, oh no, you're making a mistake. Because what does it say about Santa Claus? He's all-knowing, he's all-present, he's all-powerful. Remember these little sayings? He's all-knowing. He can tell at any time who's been naughty and who's been nice. He knows everything. All-present. He's able to bring presents to everyone worldwide in one night, everywhere at once. He's all-powerful. He can make or do anything necessary for every boy or girl so they get the presents they want. That is a god. And that's what Santa Claus is to the occult mind. It's a god. <laughs> Satan coming down the chimney originated from the Norse who had a goddess named Hertha who brought good luck to the home through fire. Thus, Santa coming down the chimney through fire came from that. Caroling, from the Greek word koros, meaning a dance, caroling was done with lustful dance songs, drunkenness, and revelry. Remember, it was pretty much anything goes during that particular time. They had the pagan eating traditions as well. Mince pies were made and eaten for good luck. Pomander balls, the yellow-orange apples, were eaten in worship of the sun god baking of cakes to worship the queen of heaven. Alcohol assumed to the point of drunkenness with gluttonous feasting and unbridled sexual activity in celebration of the sun god. Just anything goes. That was all that went on. And you had to have forced feasting, remember. You couldn't not eat. Exchange of gifts came from Nimrod, the branch of God that brings all divine gifts to men. In the Roman Saturnalia, they had the custom of what they called the strenae, which is where one would give another good luck gift. The reason they gave gifts was it's good giving good luck. Not just because we're going to give them a gift. The purpose behind it was, I'll give you a, good, a gift and I'll get good luck from it, from my gods that I'm serving. That's where it came from. The early church severely frowned upon giving gifts at this time because of the paganism, what it was all about. <coughs> the ringing the Christmas bells was also done to supposedly drive off the powerful evil spirits. The colors are also significant. You have to understand, in the cult world, 
Colors are used at particular times of the year in their activities. For instance, at the time of Halloween, orange and black are the occult colors of witchcraft. In the time here of this December, in this time, in the winter, the red and green are the occult colors. Colors of red and green. They're the traditional occult colors of the winter months, always used in the occult in the celebration of the Yule season. Green, what do we see with green? Mistletoe, the wreath, the holly, the pine tree. The red, the holly berries, Santa's clothes, Rudolph's nose. You know, he's got to have a red nose. He's got to all go along with the occult. Merry Christmas was the modern greeting which came from Io Saturnalia, which meant to delight in eating, drinking, and merry revelry like at Saturnalia. Because that's what you're doing. Have a merry time. When you say Merry Christmas to someone, you're essentially saying, have a merry time and just do whatever you want. Just have complete freedom and total license, get drunk, you know, have all this kind of stuff. Obviously, it's clear that all the customs and traditions of the modern day Christmas celebration are rooted in pagan idolatry and false worship. They certainly didn't come from Jesus. They didn't come from anything in the Word of God. They don't have anything to do with anything that's holy or righteous. Since the Christmas celebration is rooted in pagan idolatry and false worship of the sun god, why do so many Christians participate in this? Before we answer it, we must look at who celebrates Christmas. Christmas is celebrated by who? Is it celebrated just by Christians? No, it's celebrated by the people of the world. The entire world celebrates it, right? Well, let's look at John 15, 19 for a moment. This is certainly a significant scripture to bring at this time. John 15, verse 19. It says this, If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The world hated Jesus, and they hate Christians and anything that is of God, because they've rejected him. Well, that's significant. Why is the world celebrating this if it's all about Jesus? It's not about Jesus. It's all about the pagan traditions, and they hate the things of Jesus. So the world hates Christians. If Chris Christmas is a Christian celebration, why is the world celebrate it too? That wouldn't make any sense. You know what would be a celebration from a biblical standpoint is declaring the fulfillment of the Feast of the Lord. Otherwise, Pentecost, or a, a Passover, Pentecost, and then what Jesus is going to do when he comes at the time of tabernacles. Do you see anybody in the world celebrating Passover? Unleavened bread, first fruits? No. You see him having a great big time on Pentecost? No. You see him celebrating trumpets or a day of atonement or tabernacles? No. Why? Because those are God's feasts that have revel relevance to the work of Jesus Christ. Why do they like December 25th? Because it has nothing to do with Jesus. It is all about the paganistic sun god worship and all the time of revelry and all this drunken merriment and all these things. So it's significant that if the world celebrates it, you know there's got to be something wrong with it because the world hates the things of Jesus. Should Christians celebrate Christmas? Let's consider these facts. First of all, it's not the birthday of Jesus. We know that because he was born at the fall of the year. We know because there's not no, no room in the inn. We know about the shepherds. We know about the time of the tax. We know very clearly that this is the time of tabernacles when he was came. He, the, the word was made flesh and tabernacled among us. So, born at the time of tabernacles. Second, the world celebrates it too. So they should, if it was about Jesus, they should hate it if it's a Christian celebration. But it's not. Third, all the customs and traditions point to proclaiming a counterfeit Messiah. Everything did. Nothing points to Jesus when you look at it from what it's been from the time of Babylon. It all points to proclaiming a counterfeit Messiah as the Savior of the world who overcame his enemies in a false religious system worshiping the sun god. And remember, who is this all really pointing to? Satan. He's the one. He's the spirit behind all this. Fourth, Christmas is a celebration of the birth of Jesus, which was appointed as December 25th by the Roman Catholic Church to coincide with the worship of the false pagan Messiah, the sun god. Thus, it's not in line with what's true. Is it the truth? No. How could we be involved in something that's not true? We're living a lie, essentially. 
5th, the celebration of Christmas is the super church superimposing a Christian festival upon a pagan midwinter holiday. Since when do we do that? Six, the true born-again Christians rejected any involvement with Christmas from the Reformation on until the 1800s, as well as the early church did, when revival waned and then compromise took root in the church. And of course, that's where it's come to now because the great majority of Christians worldwide are celebrating Christian Christmas today. That's a, ma that a major mistake here. What about, what should Christians th do, be, do about this? Christians should have nothing to do with the Christmas celebration because it's not about Jesus. They should cross the holiday off their calendars, have no involvement. That's what they did, the Puritans did, just as the true born-again believers have done since the Reformation. True born-again believers should celebrate the birth of Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles as the interim fulfillment of that feast, proclaiming the fact that Jesus came and he now tabernacled among us in order to accomplish the redemption, and he did that great work. So why do Christians celebrate it? Many do it ignorantly. They don't know the truth, and they really think it's the real birth of Jesus. You tell a lot of them out there, they don't, they don't have any earthly idea of when Jesus was born. They just assume it must be right. You tell young kids have been told that. They don't know. Others know the pagan roots, but they still celebrate it by justifying their celebration by saying, well, I'm not celebrating Christmas according to pagan traditions, but instead I've, I've changed the paganistic meanings into Christian meanings. I'll just Christianize it. Now, that doesn't work. You cannot change paganistic meanings using the same symbols that have meant that for centuries and decide you're going to Christianize it and then keep the same symbols. That doesn't make it go whatsoever. Others know of the false worship, but they say, that's not what Christmas means in my house. They're going to change the meaning, but they're still going to do it. Why would you do something that's false to begin with? Others have changed the meanings of the pagan roots to Christian meanings. They try to Christianize it. They say the tree is the cross of Christ. Is it the cross of Christ? No, it's the pagan Messiah reincarnated. Green is the color of everlasting life. No, it's one of the occult colors of the winter god. Gifts around the tree point to gifts from the Holy Spirit through the promises of God. Any scriptures on that to bear, bear, bear that out? No. False. The gifts under the tree point to gifts from Nimrod, the false pagan Messiah. Candles are said to remind us that Jesus and Christians are the light of the world. False. The candles are lit to worship the sun god or the light of the world, and we are the light of the world when we let our light shine by proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ and living the life of a Christian, not by having candles. Holly is said to represent, represent the blood of Jesus. No, it represents the sun god giving good luck. That was what they were doing when they would worship that. In essence, some Christians have converted pagan Christmas to a Christian festival by changing the symbolic meanings. You can't convert Christmas to mean something that it really doesn't mean. You can't eliminate the real root meanings while you retain and hold on to the same symbols and traditions of paganism because they're symbols of idolatry. Example. So you just, you know, we'll see that in a minute. You can't change the symbolic meaning of something just because you want to fit it into your religion or lifestyle. That's basically what they've done. I don't want to get rid of this, so I'm going to change it somehow to make it work for me. The symbols still represent the false paganistic religious system that's proclaimed a false messiah through hidden symbols for centuries from the time of Babylon. Listen, think of this. Why do Christians celebrate it when this? Would it be okay for you to have a statue of Buddha in your house? Even though you say, well, it doesn't mean anything bad to me. It sure will. It'll bring demons into you. Would it be okay for you to have a pentagram in your house, even though it doesn't mean that in your house? You might say, well, it looks like nice art to me. It's a symbol of witchcraft and the devil. It'll bring curses upon you and evil spirits into you. God forbid that we'd ever have ever any kind of symbol of Satanist, Satanism be found in our house. Well, these symbols are all about the pagan false messiah supposedly be the one who's going to reconcile you to God. It's a lie. Why do Christians celebrate it? Another reason. What about the children, our families? What are we going to do about the children, all the gifts, all the toys, all the fun, all the great time, you know, the food and all the candy and all that stuff? Tell them the truth so they can come to true repentance. What about our witness to our families? How can I witness to my families? During that time, it's usually not a time when you're witnessing to them. You're all together with your family. Everybody's carrying little, little chit-chats going on. Is it a time when you're going to come out and preach the gospel to them? No, it's not a successful time. You're going to preach the gospel to them. Get them one-on-one -on -one 
that better, that's the better chance you're going to have to reach them. Say, well, this might cause division. This might cause all kinds of problems in the family. Well, look at Matthew chapter 10. What did Jesus come to bring? Well, I thought he came to bring peace. Well, yes, he brings peace for those that will walk in his ways, but he also brings division. Matthew 10, 34, Think not that I'm come to send peace on the earth. I'm not come, I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I'm come to set a man at variance against his father, daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He came to bring division, to separate those that are going to walk with God from those that are not going to walk with God. What do you do with these people in the family? Witness to them and fellowship with them at other times of the year or get them one-on-one -on -one when you can really talk to them. You think they're going to want to talk about Jesus when they're stuffing their face with all these things and getting my gifts and you're going to, talk, you're going to tell them about this thing about the Christmas and turn away from all this stuff when all they're, they're all zeroed in on all these great things that they want to do and all the children are all hyped up and everything? No, it's not going to be successful. Pastors and others in the ministry have not stood up and rejected it, unfortunately. One pastor said on TV, I don't see who it hurts for me to bring a Christmas tree in my house and decorate it. Looks nice, smells nice, makes me feel good. I like, I like the way it looks. Well, what is it? It's a symbol of pagan false worship. It's an abomination to bring it into any place that where you'd be as a church to worship God. But the truth is, anybody doing that essentially hurts God in the sense that he's not dis very displeased because he knows it's all about idolatry. Another pastor even said, stay away from those horrible people that refuse to celebrate Christmas. Don't listen to them. He wants to hold on to it. Hey, I'd rather follow Jesus than follow the ones that are telling me this kind of a thing. Those who reject it are honoring God. We're not horrible in our sight. We're declaring the truth to all who will listen so that they'll turn away from the idolatry. Other pastors say it's the day of his conception, which we proved is false. It's not the day of his conception whatsoever. Another pastor said our church celebrates Christmas every day of the week at Christmas time. Oh yeah, I know December 25th isn't the date Jesus was actually born. It's the time the world decided to celebrate Jesus' birthday, so that's when we do it. That's what he said. Quote, what, what, what did he say? The world decided to do it. That means the church follows the world. Does the church follow the world and what we do? I don't think so. But he said that out of his own mouth. Since when does the church follow the world? The world hates Jesus and the Christians. We must follow the truth and reject what is not true. Remember, friendship with the world makes you an enemy against God. James 4, 4. What do we do? We proclaim, teach about, and rejoice in his birth at the Feast of Tabernacles and the celebration of the interim fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. Christians should celebrate the Feast of the Lord in the light of the New Testament reality, declaring what Jesus has done for us and what he'll do at his second coming and fulfillment of them, the things that he's doing. What's our conclusion? Stand up and reject this thing. It's not of the Lord. Jesus is not the reason for the season. Nice little jingle. Jesus is the reason for the season. Kind of goes on and sounds great. Sorry, it's a big lie. And they all tout it because it's a nice little jingle. Sounds good. No, Jesus is not the reason for the season. If you participate in it, you're not just observing a, this is the important point. If you choose to participate, you would do whatever you want to do. It's your choice. You're not just observing a modern-day holiday, but in reality, honoring and embracing all the ancient traditions of Babylonian mystery religion, including acknowledging Nimrod as the false messiah if you stick one of those trees up in your house. Because that's what it's all about. When I learned all this, we tore it all down, we threw it all out, we burned it, we destroyed it all, and got rid of the whole thing and never put it up again. And this is what, 20-some years ago, I don't know how long, whenever I learned this, praise God. What's the Bible say? 1 John 5, 21 says, Keep yourself from idols. Do not compromise the truth, but stand up and reject any involvement in Christmas. It is an evil thing. Now, that's quite a statement. You might be here, or you might be seeing this or listening to this, and you might think, I never heard anything like this. I say, how can I know this is true? Go check it out in history. Go to the library and read the books. Go to the encyclopedias and read them. 
Go find books that are written by people from 50, 75, 100 years ago or so. Two Babylons is a good one written that talks about this, uh, a lot of these things. There's a lot of them, and history just bears this out. It's very clear. In fact, it's very interesting that uh, even the newspapers and the world knows all about this. This is from just from the newspaper that I cut out about how the Puritans' Christmas here was all about uh, evil stuff. And it talks about here about how uh, the Puritans brought to New England all this. They detested Christmas, the total celebration. They wanted to have nothing to do with it. The world was reporting a lot of these things that I just got done saying. <laughs> we see also, here's one that was in the Columbus Dispatch when I was there, that Christmas was outlawed in the 17th century. That's what this was in the, in the paper. They're telling the truth about it. Otherwise, you know, the world knows the truth about it. What happened to the church? And we, there was another one where pagans combine rituals in honor of the winter solstice. They're worshiping this, all this false stuff. Little articles that are here. It also happens to be, whether you know this, about a thing called Kwanzaa, which a lot of Africans uh, are involved in, their hol holiday celebration, the end time harvest. They're involved in this, their holiday that they have. And these are just articles that go on about all of this kind of stuff. Pastors have stood up and said all kinds of things that are amazing. Um, I already read what a couple of these people, if I told you who these people are, they're nationally known people, you'd know who they are. Um, the the th three of them uh, that I quoted you before, these are nationally known people. And uh, here, here's a guy who says, uh, uh, they say that Christians who won't celebrate Christmas are poor, misguided individuals. He feels sorry for them, you know, and thinks that they're missing out on these wonderful blessings. Why would we want to be involved in anything that's clearly idolatrous? It's not a good thing. So, I bring this to your information, your information to you, not to, if you didn't know this, not trying to ruin your season, trying to save you from uh, not doing things that are contrary to God's word. So what's the answer? The answer is, no, you know the truth, and then you just totally get rid of the thing and totally ignore it. We've wiped it off of our calendar. We don't have anything to do with it whatsoever because it's, a, it's, a, it's not a day that's a holiday in our mind. You know where holiday comes from, by the way? It's two words, holy and day. You got rid of the holy part by, let's, we don't like that holy stuff, so let's get rid of the why, stick an I in there and make it one word. Nobody will know what it's all about. Call it a holiday. The whole world calls we're going to go on holiday. That's what they say over in Europe and Africa and all these places. It really comes from a holy day. All these false things. See, the world has tried to deceive the populace by all these kinds of things. So, we presented this information to you so that you understand the historical roots, you see the true biblical account of the time when Jesus was born, and you see all the origin of all the things that are involved in the Christmas celebration, all the customs, and they're clearly going back to idolatrous things. And we know that it's not the birthday of Jesus. It was appointed that day in order to appease the pagans. And the world celebrates it. That ought to be a clear sign. There's got to be something wrong with this thing if the world celebrates it because the world hates the things of Jesus and they have nothing to do with the feasts of the Lord. They don't come and worship God. They, don't do any, they have nothing to do with the things of God. So then it must not be of God. And that's the truth. Yet the whole Christian world has been in compromise and the great majority of them are going to be involved in this. They're gonna, the churches have their trees up there, which is absolutely an abomination. All these ones on the TV will have their trees in their churches. You'll see them, and they'll think it's a great thing, when in reality, if they knew, it is putting up pagan symbols of idolatry in their sanctuaries. Very sad. And the sad thing is that some of these people have been presented information that they don't, they don't want to repent. They, one, one pastor said, don't send me any more letters, he said to his, uh, out to his, uh, to his uh, uh, over his, uh, uh, whatever, I'm not sure, his communication way, whether it was over the air, whether it was over by letter or whatever. He said, don't send me any more of these letters. I think it was on the TV. I don't want to hear any more letters about people telling me that about Christmas being evil. I'm going to do what I want to do with it. That's what he, that was his attitude. Isn't that sad? But 
Everybody's going to, they're going to all be responsible for it. One thing for sure, we want to keep ourselves from idolatry. So we presented this information, and it's up to you about what you want to do with it. And, uh, and what I've done, the last thing I'm going to do is do anything, and not have anything in my life that is going to be considered paganistic or evil in the sight of the Lord or participate in anything that's evil. You will never see a Christmas tree or any kind of things about Christmas in this place, that's for sure, or in our home or any place, because we're going to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you and praise you for what has been presented this day. Father, we thank you for the truth about Christmas has come forth, and we thank you that each one will make their decision about what they do. Father, I thank you for clearly brought this forth, that this is all rooted in idolatry and has nothing to do with Jesus. Thank you that the church will come to the place of repentance and stand up and reject it and proclaim the truth. Because, Father, you want to bring a, a reviving, but certainly it can't work if there's sin in the camp. Father, we thank you. This is just one area of sin that needs to be dealt with among many areas of sin in the church today. Thank you for working mightily to bring the, the whole church, the body of Christ, to the place of repentance, that they would turn away from this and want to walk in the way of holiness and do things that are pleasing in your sight. Father, we thank you. There'll be much fruit from this message in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. How many have never heard of